It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Due to the mounting public outrage, this Liberal government has admitted to doling out an additional $2.5 million in taxpayer money because of their failed two-tier bargaining system. But that admission is not going to satisfy the thousands of Ontarians who have contacted us, and I'm sure they've contacted the Premier's office as well. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Where did that money come from? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have said repeat repeatedly, there is a cost associated with negotiations. Mr. Speaker, there's always a cost associated with negotiations, and I have said quite clearly that any of the money that has been on the table has been part of the overall uh, compensation package. Mr. Speaker, I've answered that question a number of times. I answered it in the media. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that our top priority is to ensure that our students enjoy one of the best education systems in the world. They do enjoy that. That, Mr. Speaker, we want to keep it that way, and we are in a process right now. It's an unprecedented uh, process, Mr. Speaker. There hasn't been a provincial bargaining system in place before, Mr. Speaker. This is this is the first round of uh, bargaining within that uh, that provincial process, Mr. Speaker, and so we will reach conclusion with all of our Answer. education partners. And at the conclusion of that, if the leader of the opposition would like to engage in a conversation about how to how to modify Bill 122, Mr. Speaker how to modify that process, we are open and welcoming that process. I hope I don't have to start. Uh, supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and I'll be more specific. Every dollar budgeted in the Education Ministry is assigned to a specific program. In June of 2014, we learned the Minister of Education took $1.6 million in funding for an anti-bullying and autism awareness program to pay the legal fees in their lawsuit with Ontario school bus drivers. So again, Mr. Speaker, a very simple accounting question for the Premier. From which program line item in the 2015 education budget did the Premier take the $2.5 million for her mismanaged negotiations? As I've said, the, uh, the proposals that are on the table, the money that is on the table, Mr. Speaker, is all part of the compensation envelope. That's what we've said all along, because these negotiations are operating within a net-zero environment. It sounds to me that my message wasn't uh, strong enough, and if I have to ramp it up, I will. Stop it. Please carry on. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition will be aware that on Friday the Education Minister and I said to our education partners that what is critical right now is that we come to an agreement. The, uh, the situation that pertains in our schools right now in terms of the, the cleanliness of the schools, Mr. Speaker, and the, op the uh, opportunity for kids to take part in a full program, including extracurriculars, Mr. Speaker, has to be dealt with. And so we've said We've said that by November 1st, Mr. Speaker, if there is not a deal in place, if there's not an agreement in place, Mr. Speaker, or the uh, labor uh, labor action has not stopped, Mr. Speaker, then there will be the potential for uh, uh, the terms of the uh, employment to be changed, Mr. Speaker, and that that could include docking of pay. Answer. We have not issued that permission yet, Mr. Speaker. We have said quite clearly till November 1st we need, and everyone's at the table, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And that bargaining is continuing now. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, this explanation doesn't wash. Even though the Premier has said this is business as usual last week, the Global Mail's article reported that ETFO has said they have not accepted and will not accept any government money to pay for bargaining costs. The CBC quotes Labour lawyer Howard Levitt, who said covering a union's bargaining costs is unusual and raises all kinds of questions. He said, I quote, it's counterintuitive and antithetical to the interests of the taxpayer and employers. Mr. Speaker, if the payments were not made in the best interest of taxpayers, will the Premier tell us who other than the Liberal Party is this in the best interest of? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. 
Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think that the uh, Leader of the Opposition probably uh, is aware of the commentary of many people on this subject, Mr. Speaker. It's not unprecedented for uh, a party in the public or the private sector to assist unions with the cost of collective bargaining. A CAW uh, negotiator told the Star, and I quote, it is not unheard of for private companies to cover all or part of the cost of a union's expenses associated directly with negotiating, negotiating a contract, unquote. Mr. Speaker, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, if at at the conclusion of this round of uh, negotiations, which is unprecedented, there has not been a provincial round before, Mr. Speaker. If at the end of that, um, the decisions have been made uh, by those that decided that uh, shouting people down is the answer. I will move to warnings. At the end of this process, the leader of the opposition, and I don't know what his experience with negotiating is, Mr. Speaker, but I would be happy to have him and, quite Answer. frankly, the leader of the third party. We can talk about input into the negotiating process. I'd be very interested to hear their concerns as we round up the uh, after we have uh, come to agreements with our education partners, Mr. Yep. Speaker. Yep. The question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Premier told the Toronto Star last week that paying $2.5 million for union negotiations is business as usual. No one is buying that. The only reason the Liberals' idea of business as usual is out is because their secret deal was leaked. Every business I know keeps receipts to justify their expenses. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier find it acceptable that she gave $2.5 million without a single receipt? Simple yes or no. Is it acceptable to pay that amount of money of taxpayers' hard-earned dollars without a single receipt? Thank you. I guess somebody didn't hear what I said. Mr. Speaker, I believe what I said that uh, is that in a twenty billion dollar. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Carry on. The education. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell problem, is warned. Speaker is more than a twenty billion dollar enterprise. There are costs associated with nego negotiating agreements in that environment, Mr. Speaker. That is what I said. And what is critical to me right now, as the Premier and the Minister of Education, is that we've got students in our public elementary schools, Mr. Speaker, who are not able to have the full program. Their schools are not being cleaned in the way that they should be, Mr. Speaker. And my focus is on working with our education partners to get an agreement, Mr. Speaker, in an environment where we are operating in a provincial negotiation process. Answer. That is new, Mr. Speaker. It is the first time we have gone through this formal process. And if at the conclusion of this process, the Leader of the Opposition would like The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Finish wrap up, please. Bring his experience and his knowledge of negotiations to the table. We'd be happy to hear from him on how he'd like to make the system better, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the public isn't going to buy that excuse. Business as usual to the Premier means paying multi million dollar organizations to negotiate, and they're making up a one page document to justify it. If this bargaining is really business as usual, as you say, as the Global Mail has said, I quote, let's see an accounting down to the penny. All those zeros in a row suggest no accounting was done. The Globe went on to ask, what was the money really for? Mr. Speaker, if the Premier can't produce a spreadsheet down to the penny that justifies this $2.5 million, maybe the Premier can explain and tell the House what was this really for. Thank you. Education. Minister of Education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I think it's important to understand that, in fact, this is not business as usual. This is a transformational round of negotiations that's implementing a new collective bargaining scheme for the first time ever. In fact, we have we have. Uh, had significant discussions for the last year. We spent six months uh, with the initial step of settling on central local split. We have been in the process of literally bringing hundreds 
hundreds and hundreds of collective agreements into nine central collective agreements, Speaker. And that takes a lot of work and a long time. Answer. We recognize that both the school boards and the unions have unusual costs in this unique round of collective Thank you. Policy. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker. Again, for the Premier, and business as usual is your government's talking point. You can run from it now, but it's what you said. This government gave away $2.5 million without asking for a single receipt. The best explanation the Minister of Education can muster was the money was for hotel rooms and pizza. I'm not sure where the Minister buys her pizza, but the pepperoni must be gold-plated. <laughs> is, is the Premier really going to insult the intelligence of the people of Ontario and expect them to believe $2.5 million was for hotels and pizza? Or, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier come clean and tell the Legislature, tell the people of Ontario what this money was really for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, you are not going to get an opportunity to get shots in when I'm standing. Please. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And the uh, pizza. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. But the process of renting hotel rooms for literally a year, not, not residential rooms, but meeting rooms. We've been, we have been renting meeting rooms for over a year. If I were some people who are already warned, I wouldn't be saying anything. This is not an unusual practice. I can remember an occasion during the Mike Harris government where he called in the school, his people called in school boards and unions. And do you know who paid for the hotel? To the chair, please. Mike Harris's government. Remind for everyone to the chair, please. New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier has been rushing to sell off Hydro One. She's refused to allow a referendum, public hearings, or any form at all, Speaker, of public feedback. But every time that the people of Ontario have had a chance to express an opinion, Speaker, they have overwhelmingly told this Premier to stop the sell off of Hydro One and to find another way to fund infrastructure. Ontario families, municipalities, businesses all want the Premier to slow down and find another way to fund infrastructure. Does the Premier believe that the people of Ontario are wrong and that there is no other way to finance infrastructure? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, it is extremely important that we look at all avenues to, uh, in, to invest in infrastructure because the fact is there is a, uh, a long backlog of need in this province, Mr. Speaker. Remember, there were 10 years before we came into office where a government didn't invest in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We came in in 2003. We started making those investments. I've said all along, Mr. Speaker, that the money that we are uh, putting into infrastructure, the $130 billion over the next 10 years that was what we can that is what we can do but we've always said we need a federal partner to work with us mr speaker so we are implementing our plan as we committed to do when we went to the people last year mr speaker we will implement that plan we will make those investments but we also need a federal partner so that we can do all of the things that are necessary across the province Answer. mr speaker thank you supplementary 
said many times that they have to rush the sell-off of Hydro One. Uh, she said that they will, she will push her half-baked scheme out the door because of the sudden urgency of building infrastructure. She more or less repeated that just now, Speaker. But here are the facts. In 2014-15, Speaker, the government spent $300 million less on transportation capital than it had budgeted for. In 2013-14, Speaker, the government spent a whopping $1.2 billion less, Speaker, than budgeted for. So, will the Premier admit finally that the sell-off of Hydro One has never been about money for infrastructure? Mr. Speaker, broadening the ownership in Hydro One is all about investment in infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, there is a 10-year plan that we have in place, and if there are projects that come in under budget, that's something that the leader of the third party should be celebrating, Mr. Speaker. There is planning, there is building going on, Mr. Speaker. She knows full well that in every municipality around this province, in every community, there is a need for investment within the community, and there is a need for investment to link communities to one another, Mr. Speaker. That is in the best interest of our economic prosperity, Mr. Speaker, as a province, but also community by community. It's what businesses need in order to be able to expand and bring more business here to Ontario. That's why we're making these investments, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, in fact, the Liberals have had 12 years to build infrastructure, but really they haven't. And for 12 years, New Democrats have been pushing them. Order. For the sake of those that uh, may not have been here to hear what I had said, we're at the warning stage. Have been pushing them to uh, make those badly needed, needed investments, Speaker, but frankly, they didn't. And now, suddenly, the Premier says it is urgent. But public accounts show us very clearly, warned. Speaker, that in just the last two years, this Premier spent one. $1.5 billion less than she budgeted for, Speaker. Wow. The Premier is not even utilizing the money that she has, and yet she con continues to insist that she has to sell off Hydro One in an urgent way. Will this Premier admit that she does not need to sell off Hydro One and just stop this wrong-headed move, Speaker? No, Mr. Speaker, I won't, because I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the leader of the third party gets around this province. But if she's been in the Windsor region at all over the next, over the last three years, she will know that there's been building going on, Mr. Speaker. She just has to go up to Eglinton uh, Avenue in Toronto, Mr. Speaker, and she will see that there is building going on. So yeah. there is infrastructure being built all over this province, historic Mr. Numbers. Speaker, historic investment. And the fact is, the way the budgets work, there are there is money that is invested in planning, there's money invested in accumulating property, there are environmental assessments that go on, Mr. Speaker. There is work going on across the province. That work can't go on unless we make the investments that we are making. So we are going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, because the Hamilton LRT will not happen if we don't do the upfront work Answer. to make sure that those shovels get in the ground. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Questions also for the Premier. People have been telling this Premier to find another way, Speaker, to fund infrastructure instead of selling off Hydro One. We know that the Premier has other options. According to the government's own reports, a 1% increase in corporate taxes would raise up to $700 million a year, Speaker. That's much more than the $400 million a year that her sell off scheme will apparently earn. Will this Premier admit that she ha has other options, but instead stubbornly refuses to take those options and instead sell off Hydro One, a, a plan, a scheme, an effort that Ontarians soundly reject? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, whether we are talking about investment in infrastructure or whether we are talking about enhancement to social programs, Mr. Speaker, or whether we are talking about supporting businesses and supporting communities, the leader of the third party only has one answer, Mr. Speaker, and that is raise corporate taxes. She spends that $700 million over and over and over again, Mr. Speaker. The fact is we know that businesses in Ontario need to be competitive. They are operating now in a competitive tax environment, Mr. Speaker, but they need something else. They 
need infrastructure investments so that they can move their goods and their people can move around, Mr. Speaker, and be connected to the communities that they want to be connected to. That's why we're making these investments. The oversimplification by the third party will not get business investing in this province, Mr. Speaker. We are taking yes, the steps to bring business to Ontario, to increase connectivity, Mr. Speaker, and improve Thank people's you. quality of life. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier in the past has often said, and I quote, it would be great if we had a federal partner working with us on infrastructure. In fact, she said that today, Speaker. And now the federal government has promised billions upon billions of dollars for infrastructure uh, and transit. The Premier insists she can't wait for the federal money, though, because she has to rush to sell off Hydro One. But the Premier also has $1.5 billion in unspent infrastructure money from the last Last two years, Speaker. Shame. It is clear that the Premier doesn't need the money all that quickly, Speaker. So my question is a simple one. Why is the Premier ploughing ahead with the sell-off of Hydro One when it is so obviously unnecessary? Mr. Speaker, not, it is necessary. just because the money hasn't been uh, Put out, Mr. Speaker, spent doesn't mean that it's not needed for current projects. So I just I would just explain to the leader of the third party that the money that's allocated actually has to be kept for that purpose so that when that bill comes in for the work that's been done, we actually have the money to pay for it. So, Mr. Speaker, that is the way the funding works. The uh, the projects are underway, Mr. Speaker, and the fact is that we've said all along we need a federal partner. The money that we have to invest in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, will do a lot of good, but it's not all that needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. I've, I've worked with uh, premiers across the country, and we know Answer. that we are just barely keeping up, and in some cases not keeping up, with the needs of infrastructure in the country. We need that federal partner to make sure that we can build new and we Thank can you. enhance the economy of the whole country, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, according to media reports, it is this Premier herself who refuses to even consider asking Ontario's wealthiest corporations to pay just a little bit more to fund infrastructure. And it is this Premier who has allowed $1.5 billion in infrastructure money to go unspent. And it is this Premier that cannot wait for the billions of dollars promised from the federal government, Speaker. The Premier's justifications for this unnecessary sell-off, Speaker, are insulting to the public's intelligence. Will this Premier do the right thing, stop the sell-off of Hydro One, and find another way to fund her infrastructure promises? Thank you. Mr. Development, employment, and Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's, what's insulting to the intelligence of the people of this province is the leader of the third party's contention by, is it, it, to raise corporate taxes by just a little bit. That's going to solve all of our problems in this province. That's that's going to cover all of the expenses we need when it comes to investing in infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the biggest concern in a fiercely competitive global economy of our business community is that we would take the advice of the party opposite, jack up corporate, uh, corporate uh, taxes, Mr. Speaker, kill jobs in this province, stop building infrastructure, make our economy uncompetitive. Mr. Speaker, this party, this Premier is committed to making this economy, our business community, competitive. Competitive global economy. We're going to do what it takes to do that, and we're going to act contrary to the views of the members opposite. Thank you. Your question, member from the and Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Treasury Board President. Uh, her job is to eliminate the deficit and to ensure government accountability. But the slush fund payments to education unions flies in the face of her personal commitments to this assembly. We learned of a secret $1 million payment to OSSTF in the media. The education minister said it was a one-time thing until she got caught, and now it's $2.5 million. Who knows what secret payments will add up to by the time she finishes speaking here in question period today, and all without any receipts. And now we know that other unions who may not have gotten this golden handshake or golden milkshake at the meeting space uh, may, may want more. So my question is, and it's a very serious one to the Treasury Board President, how could you let the education minister undermine your deficit reduction 
reduction targets, and as importantly, Bill 8, a law you put before this House to increase accountability after eHealth Orange Thank and you. the cancelled gas plant scandal. Thank you. You see the police? You see the police? Thank you. President, Treasury Board. The Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as a result of the year that we spent at, a, at the hotel, I would like to remind people that, in fact, we actually did end up with the first ever presidential collective agreement. We have collective agreements with the English Catholic teachers. We have collective agreements with the public secondary teachers. We have collective agreements with the French teachers who work in both the English public and the, or sorry, the French public and the French Catholic school boards. We have three presidential collective agreements. Those represent hundreds of collective agreements being folded into three provincial central collective agreements. That took time. And when you, when you take time, there are costs involved in taking that time. The, uh, and we recognize that. And we have supported both Answer. our school board colleagues and our union colleagues in coming to a three-way tripartite agreement in this transformational roundabout. Thank you. Supplementary. She may have been spending some time at the Hotel Grand Mare with Chuck Gite, an unresolved a receipt speaker, but the rest of us were standing here defending Ontario taxpayers and particularly Ontario students. Back to the Treasury Board President. The Liberals handed out $2.5 million at least in slush fund money that was intended for kids in classrooms. They cut checks to the same unions who helped them 18 months ago run attack ads against the Progressive Conservative Party. Even Sam Handen, one of the unions they do not have a deal with, called this deal unethical. I ask the Premier. It Carry on. I've heard of stealing candy from a baby, but I've never heard of stealing money from kids in the classroom to get re-elected. Will the Treasury No, 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 no. That, that, that's, uh, I'll ask the member to withdraw. Withdrawn. Finish Will up. the Treasury Board Minister explain to this House why it's okay to Question. get rid of her deficit reduction targets, why it's okay to eliminate her own Bill 8, her own accountability of law, and will the Treasury Board Minister stand up and tell us why she's Thank you. Please. You see it, please? When I uh, when I stand, members sit. Minister of Education. And I think, Speaker, we've now discovered what the fundamental issue here is. Is we have a difference in the way that we work with our colleagues in both the school Order. boards and in the unions. The way they want to work with the unions, as we found uh, from their campaign platform, was to fire 100,000 people. Probably, from as near as we could figure out with their calculations, fire 20,000 people in the school board sector. We actually don't think that that's the way to work with people. We think that we need to bring together our school board colleagues and our union colleagues, and we all need to sit at the same table and come to agreement. That's why we brought new Answer. school board collective bargaining legislation, which, if memory serves me, they voted against because they don't believe in the principle Thank of negotiation. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier's recent threat aimed at education workers continues to create chaos in our schools. Students, parents and education workers want quality education in Ontario, but this government is only providing cuts and uncertainty. For more than a year, the Liberal government has failed to treat the negotiating process with respect and attention. Just like this government has failed to treat education with respect and attention, given more than a decade of chronic underfunding of our public education system. They are proud of a planned $500 million, cut, $500 million cut to education, proud of firing 21 early childhood educators in Windsor-Essex, proud of laying off 118 teachers in Peterborough, 
This government's record on education is nothing to be proud of. The Minister of Education has lost all credibility and needs to go. Question. Will the Premier admit that a recent threat to education workers is only going to cause more chaos in our schools and force students and families to pay the price for her minister's failure? Thank you. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, on the one hand, we have the official opposition saying that we have spent too much time yep, because there are costs associated time. with uh, collective bargaining, and we've spent yep. too much time well, negotiating, well, Mr. Speaker. And there shouldn't we shouldn't be putting out that money to pay for those uh, those negotiation processes. Yep. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, we've got the NDP saying that we really should let this go on forever, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> that the collective bargaining process should go on forever, that we shouldn't use any of the tools that are actually part of the, uh, the labour law, Mr. Speaker, to bring to a conclusion a situation that is putting kids at risk, that is not giving families the information that they need about their kids' progress, that is keeping schools dirty, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to let that go on and on and on. The, our education Answer. partners know that I believe in collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. They know that I believe we are allies with them, but they also know, Mr. Speaker, Thank that you. we have to act in the best interest of children. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It was, in, it was in fact the government that walked away from bargaining, not at vote. Now let's get back to the facts, Speaker. Speaker, the Premier uttering threats and stomping her feet because the Minister of Education couldn't do her job is no way to negotiate. Since the beginning of the process, the Minister of Education has failed to do her job when it comes to bargaining. Now our kids are paying the price of increased chaos in our schools. As if cuts to special education funding in eight boards totaling $22.5 million wasn't bad enough. Students and families shouldn't be paying the price for the minister's incompetence and neglect of the education file. My question is simple. Will the premier fire the minister of education immediately? Yes or no? Thank you. Finger. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just want uh, I just want <laughs> this house and the people of Ontario to know that uh, our Minister of Education has as her top priority the best interests of uh, the children of this province, the students of this province, Mr. Speaker. And there are there are probably few people in the province who know as much about the education yeah. system yeah. as the Minister of Education. So, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that we have we have one of the best education systems in the world, Mr. Speaker. Co people come from all over the world to look at how we have developed the education system. 84% of kids in this province graduate from high school, Mr. Speaker. It is a model. So the fact is that we need our uh, our government needs to be working with school boards and with our education yes, partners, both teachers and support staff. That's what we're doing as part of the collective bargaining process. It's not easy, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it Thank takes you. time, but it is necessary. The question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, over the summer, as mandated by the Premier, your ministry conducted a review of the rules governing our municipal elections. We are keenly aware that our local democracies are critical hubs of civic activity and an important entry point to Ontario's governance system. That's why our municipalities and the local leaders we choose need to be supported by strong, clear and fair rules. These rules need to be simple and reflect how modern campaigns should be run. They should address the changing spectrum of needs that communities encounter throughout the municipal election process. Mr. Speaker, these are important goals. Through you, can the minister tell this House a bit about the review and its consultation process? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, I'd be uh, delighted to respond to the question from the member from Davenport. I want to begin by saying Ontarians uh, <clears throat> really care about municipal elections. Yeah. They care about voting and they want to make sure that their voices are heard. So over the last uh, several months, I've been traveling the province uh, talking to over 200 uh, municipal councils and a number of citizens about uh, uh, how they view their election system. And we've been hearing a lot about what works and what doesn't work so well. Uh, we look uh, specifically and closely uh, at campaign finance rules uh, whether third-party advertising should be regulated, uh, challenges and barriers to making elections more accessible, 
and whether municipal election rules are effectively enforced. Speaker, I believe that hearing from as many municipalities and Ontarians as possible, and we've had wonderful uh, feedback, uh, is the way yes, to forward. And we'll be presenting uh, more specifics very soon. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In addition to the goals the minister has laid out this time around, the Municipal Elections Act review has an added objective, and that's our government's commitment to provide municipalities with the option to implement ranked ballot voting for our next municipal election cycle in 2018. Speaker, as a new frontier, this interesting election tool has garnered significant attention in conversations throughout our communities, including my own riding of Davenport, and in various news coverage throughout the media. Our municipal partners have been considering whether moving forward with efforts to establish ranked ballot voting in 2018 will meet their community's needs. Across the municipal councils, there has been some confusion as late on this matter. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister share what he and his team have been hearing and working on in regards to ranked ballots? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd be delighted to uh, respond. Uh, as uh, simply as I can, we've had over 1,900 responses uh, on the issue of ranked ballots. About 97 per cent of them uh, view it very positively. There are some that don't, um, and, and uh, some of those people might be predictable, but that's okay. Uh, so we're working uh, very hard on it. Uh, we think that uh, anything that will enhance uh, voter turnout and get people to, to give a little bit more attention to the importance of uh, municipal campaigns is uh, worth doing. It's a good thing. Um, we have reason to believe, based on the experience in other countries, that uh, a move to rank ballots would make election campaigns more civil, ensure candidates uh, will have a vested interest in working better together right from the get-go, and reduce negative campaigning Answer. Uh, while increasing focus on issues that matter. Uh, it things. will be an option. It will be coming forward when we deliver the whole package, and I look forward Thank to you. it. Thank you. Question the member from Bruce Bayon South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Last week, this minister was quick to defend her government's payouts, $1 million to SSTF, $1 million to WECTA, and a half a million dollars to AEFO, on the grounds that, and I quote her statement from Hansard, we haven't fired anybody, we haven't cut anybody, end of quote. I want to remind the minister of the reality that her government is firing, and they are cutting, and they are compromising our children's education by taking away $2.5 million sure. from students and giving it to teachers' unions. In my riding alone, 50 education assistants have been eliminated and consequently, special education students have been told to stay at home or not to come to school as a result of scant resources. My question to the minister is, does she not respect our students and educational assistants enough to acknowledge there is a cut to the classroom? Thank you. Minister of education. No, there are not any cuts to the classroom as a result of the collective agreements that we have negotiated. In fact, the, uh, the, uh, the generators in terms of class size generators are the same. In fact, many of them are actually the same, the ones that you legislated. But uh, the class size generators are the ones that were in place prior to the agreements being cut. Uh, we agreed uh, in a previous round of bargaining that we would hire additional teachers beyond the, uh, those class size ratios. And in fact, as a result of those previous agreements, we hired 2,300 additional teachers over and beyond the class size generators. And as a result of these collective agreements, yes, we continue to fund those 2,300 teachers in addition to the classroom Thank you. teachers. Well done. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Minister of Education. When is a cut not a cut? The reality is, you have taken $2.5 million away from our vulnerable students. Aaron Bessie's sons, Owen and Nola, who are autistic, Kathy Cotter's seven year old daughter, who has rental dystrophy and is legally school. blind, Candace Schuber's eight year old son, who has type 1 diabetes and suffers from hypoglycemic episodes. With their EAs gone, there's no one to watch and keep them safe. I sent the minister personal letters from more than 30 parents of special needs students whose EAs have been fired. These students, their parents, and every special education teacher and support staff who receive their pink slips are deeply offended that this minister is flippant in regard to their loss of jobs and classroom resources. They can't understand how she can continue to stand there and say, and I quote, we haven't fired, we haven't cut with a straight face. The minister is responsible for this mess. 
on behalf of these students and families who want their children to Question. receive the education they're entitled to, I ask, will you bring back the EAAs? Who will, will you put the children first? Here, here. Thank you. Minister. So if we can just reflect a little bit on special needs funding, special education funding, Speaker. Uh, this year, this this year, the 2015-16 uh, school year, uh, students with spec ed uh, requirements are receiving 2.72 billion in addition to the regular funding that goes to every student. If you look at that, that's an increase of 225.7 million, or actually 9% since 2012-3, so over the last few years. If you go back to uh, the start year, the 2002-3 year, it's an increase of 68 percent or 1.1 billion dollars since we took office we are not cutting special yeah, yeah. education thank you yeah. new question the member from hamilton east stony creek thank you speaker my question is to the premier just two weeks ago in reference to u.s steel justin trudeau stated that the canadian government needs to work with its provincial partners to ensure that people's pensions are protected speaker i couldn't agree more U.S. Steel has a towering moral debt to its workers and its pensioners. Will the Premier use her influence with Mr. Trudeau to protect U.S. Steel pensioners, to push for the release of those secret documents and agreements with U.S. Steel, and to ensure that these moral debts will, in the future, be legal debts so that this kind of theft can never happen to Canadians again? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite makes an important point. Uh, mind you, court proceedings are still ongoing, but our government remains committed to working with all the stakeholders. Uh, our goal, of course, is to achieve a long-term viability of uh, the ongoing operations of uh, U.S. Steel Canada, uh, and more importantly, to protect the employees and the retirees and suppliers and customers who are affected. Um, and while it is still ongoing, we do want to ensure the member opposite that our government will work with the retirees by providing the support necessary over the next six months so that they can have their health benefits. And more importantly, uh, we'll establish uh, the transition fund to enable that to take place. And as the restriction is ongoing, uh, it's important to note that the pensioners and the, and the workers will be receiving uh, their benefit plan. To the point made around unsealing those secret documents by the Harris government that was achieved previously, indeed we will stand by yes, the retirees and U.S. Steel Canada to ensure that that's unlocked. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, it's bad enough that U.S. Steel pension funds themselves are underfunded, but there is no trust account at all to pay the benefits of the pensioners. Indeed, there seldom is. The benefits that form part of an employee's promise to its retirees are funded from the company's current cash flows, not from trust accounts. Pensions were once funded this way, and after many bitter lessons, we decided on a better way. Perhaps it's time for other post-retirement benefits to receive the same protection. What will the Premier do to ensure that the medical, dental, health benefits of retirees are given the same financial stability and security as their pensions? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as the member knows, as restructuring continues, it's important to remember that the company will, that is still operating and the retirees are still receiving their pensions. And as the member knows, and he makes reference to this, Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada with a fund like the PB, PBGF, the Pension Benefits Guarantee Fund, that were, and this was made in 2012, to put in more sustainable footing, including increasing assessments and eligibility, eligibility conditions to cover those benefits. And I can confirm that the current estimates indicate that the PBGF is financially sound. The bottom line is that although the courts are processing and going through the approval process, this will not affect the PBGF coverage if needed, Mr. Speaker, in the future. And again, I add that we will, as a, as a government, continue to support the retirees and the workers over the next six months. That will yes, not sir. implicate the PBGF, but it is there, the only province in Canada that offers that, and we recognize that more has to be done. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, we all know that Ontario's police officers work hard in our communities every day to keep us all safe. They have helped make Sudbury and Ontario one of the safest places to live, work, and raise a family. And there is a growing recognition everyone has a role to play in building partnerships, 
providing opportunities to prevent crime and to promote safe, healthy communities. This means our police services must form partnerships with social service, education, health and community groups to address social ills and proactively prevent crime. For we all know that this is the most effective way to create positive, lasting change. For example, in my community of Sudbury, we have seen the positive impact of the strong partnerships between the Greater Sudbury Police Service and the local service providers to Question. proactively address these kinds of issues. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain what he is doing to support the development of community safety planning thank across you. Ontario? Sir, Community Safety and Correctional well, thank, Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Sudbury for the important question. Speaker, as we uh, work to build stronger, safer, and healthier communities right across Ontario, one of the key challenges is addressing social issues that lead to crime. Our Proceeds of Crime Frontline Policing Grant helps form partnerships between local police services and social service pro providers to just do that. Speaker, this year Ontario is investing $2 million in 25 community safety and well-being programs to support local police and community groups in their efforts to build safer and stronger communities. For example, Speaker, the St. Thomas and Elma Police Services are, are working in helping police connect with seniors to combat um, elder abuse. Uh, Peterborough Police Services increasing access to safe housing. So, speaker, through the OPP Prince Edward County Detachment, we are making sure that our kids stay, stay uh, safe online. And Speaker, through the Cornwall Police Service, we're providing counseling and other services yes, to combat domestic violence and help those affected by it. Speaker, in fact, this year Ontario is investing $100,000 in the second phase of crime pre prevention through social development program in Sudbury to support local police and community groups. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I am pleased to hear about the important contribution the Proceeds of Crime Frontline Policing Grant is making to community safety and well-being initiatives in Sudbury and across our great province. As the Minister mentioned, Mr. Speaker, the grant will go to funding Phase 2 of the Crime Prevention Through Social Development Program. This initiative is being led by the Community Safety and Wellbeing Planning Steering Committee, which is made up of important local service groups. Their goal is to come together to build a collective crime reduction strategy and improve overall community safety and well-being to prevent crime and address social issues in the community. But, Mr. Speaker, Ontarians need to know that the good work like this is also happening in communities across this province. So, through you, Mr. Speaker, Question. can the minister explain what he is doing to encourage other communities to develop the same sort of community safety and well-being initiatives that we have in Sudbury? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. Right. Speaker, we are working to ensure that the good work that is happening in Sudbury will also happen in other neighbourhoods and communities across the province. That is why the cornerstone of our new strategy for a safer Ontario will be community safety and well-being plans, which will be in every part of the province. Speaker, these plans will help to lower the demand for a reactive, resource-intensive emergency responses by developing a collaborative and evidence-based approach to community safety. I would like to recognize those community speakers from across the province who are already taking steps to make the province an even safer place to live by by putting these kinds of plans in place because the only way to truly fight crime is to prevent it happening in the first place. Speaker, these are the kind of proactive and collaborative efforts we will continue to encourage through our community safety and well-being plans as we work to build stronger and safer communities across Ontario. Yes, we thank uh, communities like Sudbury, who's taken a leadership role, Speaker, in, in setting up an example of how this proactive model could thank work. You. Thank you. Your question, the member from Holland and Norfolk. Yeah, Speaker, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, clearly a minister who should be fighting for farmers at here, the here. Uh, cabinet table. We're fired. And we have dairy farmers here today. However, the minister said idly by, well, now 174 municipalities, the vast majority of them rural, have passed resolutions opposing the sale of Hydro One. They have. And the minister himself has said, we'll keep Hydro One, quote, in public hands. Mm -hmm. So now, Speaker, when will the minister okay. speak up at the cabinet table to keep Hydro Changed One in public hands? Minister, Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Speaker, it's a strange question coming from a uh, member from, uh, from that party, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as we all know in this House, in the 2014 election, that party campaigned in favour of broadening the ownership of Ontario yeah, right. Power Generation and Hydro One, Mr. There Speaker. Yeah. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, they indicated that rates would be protected through the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, the present leader of that party has essentially said the same thing, Mr. Speaker. So when will that party disavow themselves of the commitment they made in the 2014 election campaign? <laughs> Speaker, the Minister of Agriculture is sitting over here silent. Shame. Sitting idly silent, I might say, with respect to the Hydro One fire sale while rural municipalities pass resolution after resolution opposing it. Among the now 174 municipalities that oppose the sale are the Ag Minister's own Peterborough County and Peterborough itself. In the past, Minister Leo opposed privatization, and I quote, we'll never look at it, end quote. His constituents opposed the sale. The farmers, as ministry represent, opposed the sale. My question, Speaker. When will the minister finally represent farmers at the cabinet table? I, I'm not referring to other cabinet ministers, and oppose the sale of Hydro One. Good job, Toby. You see the case? You see the case? Thank you, Minister. Uh, excuse me. Well, these want infrastructure. They've said it over and over and over again, Mr. Speaker. And if they look at the results of the recent federal election campaign, Mr. Speaker, the country in every province said they want infrastructure. That's why they got the result that they did from a party that was promising infrastructure. Uh, you know, we did a lot of consultation, Mr. Speaker, and the mayors, one after the other, said they need infrastructure. We have a $130 million billion dollar infrastructure program over 10 years, led by the Premier, Mr. Speaker. That is real change in terms of meeting the deficit uh, of the infrastructure deficit, Mr. Speaker. And the $4 billion that will go to infrastructure from broadening the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, is $4 billion Answer. that will not come from taxpayers' money, will not come from cuts, Mr. Speaker, and will not come from borrowing. It's sound Thank fiscal you. management, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Manufacturing is part of the foundation of our community in Oshawa. Consecutive Liberal governments, however, have stayed seated on the sidelines while auto jobs have disappeared, and our community has lost hundreds of millions of dollars in auto investment. Now, the Premier has endorsed the TPP Sight Unseen, a secret deal that is expected to put approximately 20,000 jobs in the auto industry at risk. In fact, this past weekend, the CEO of Ford Canada said, and I quote, we see the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a setback. Premier, what do you have to say to the thousands of people in Oshawa and across the province whose jobs are at risk because you have decided to support a deal that you haven't even seen yet? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Employment and Infrastructure. Things, one of the things correct in the, in the members' uh, comments are we haven't seen the deal yet. And I think it's, it is important for us to see the deal, but we've seen a lot of speculation about it, and we've, the, the previous federal government did provide some details, uh, which the members write uh, is concerning to us in terms of the impact on our auto sector. Now, we're not suggesting that the federal government be totally irresponsible and walk away from this incredibly huge trade, trading block. That wouldn't be good for any Canadians or any Ontario or any sector, but we do believe that the previous government did not do a good job when it came to negotiating on behalf of our auto sector. We were very clear about that. In fact, we've written to the federal minister. We were very clear in our comments between the premier and the prime minister that they had to stand up for, for that sector and our agri-food agri -food sector as well. Answer. We don't think they did a good job in negotiating the aspects with regard to auto, but at the same time, we've got to be responsible in our overall all uh, comments on the TPP because we have to think of thank the you. overall good of our economy. Supplementary. Okay. Thank you, Speaker. The actions of the Liberal government, or lack thereof, come with a real cost to families in my riding, making it that much harder for them to keep up or get ahead without good, stable jobs. 
The TPP has significant consequences for the province. From what we do know, Canada got the wrong end of this lopsided deal. Even Stephen Harper admitted that the auto sector may not benefit from the TPP trade agreement. Now we're hearing from industry giants like Diane Craig that not only will this deal jeopardize auto sector jobs in Ontario, but it will also negatively impact manufacturing sales. This is yet another example of the Premier's short-sighted vision for Ontario and for Ontarians. Premier, will you, cons will you reconsider your position on the TPP and ensure that good automotive jobs are protected in the province? Thank you. Minister. Seriously, Mr. Speaker, the members got to pay better attention to these issues as they're developing. We are on record publicly, Mr. Speaker. We've written to the minister to ensure that it's on the record, the federal minister, previous one, that we're standing up for the auto industry in, in this province. And we've stood up uh, repeatedly on this particular issue, and we will continue to. But, Mr. Speaker, what that sector is really concerned about as well is having a third party in this province that wants to jack up their corporate tax rates. Mr. Speaker, that's not going to help investment in auto in this province. That's going to kill jobs in Oshawa. That's going to kill jobs across this province. What they also want, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure they can get their auto parts to and from their plants. They can't do that if we don't have the courage to make the investments that we need to make in infrastructure. You can't have it both ways. Yes, if you're standing up for the auto sector, you've got to stand up and keeping them competitive from a tax perspective and competitive in terms of infrastructure as well. Well. Thank you. The the member from Northumberland, Quincy West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Uh, Minister, under Premier Wynne's leadership, our government has placed strong emphasis on supporting small, rural, and northern communities across the province. Our, gov our government economic plan is targeted to create jobs and spur economic growth. And we're focused on investing in people, investing in infrastructure, and supporting dynamic and innovative business climate. I know our investment through Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is doing just that. Committing $100 million annually through the NOHFC is a very clear indication that, in fact, the North is being heard. Speaker, can the minister from this house on, tell this house on how our government is investing in Northern Ontario communities to ensure they have the tools they need to compete Question. competitive in the global market. Thank you. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thank you very much to the member for North Northumberland, Quiddy West, for that great question. And you did indeed reference the uh, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation. I think I'm very proud uh, to chair that uh, that great program, $100 million fund uh, annually, which has uh, brought forward extraordinary investments in, uh, in the North. In fact, over the last 10 years, we've invested over $1 billion, which has leveraged about $3.6 billion in thousands of projects and creating or sustaining 26,000 jobs across Northern Ontario. We know how, how important each and every job is. And while we are incredibly uh, proud of our continued support for public sector projects all across the North, I've often said, Speaker, that I honestly think there is not one community in Northern Ontario that has not seen a application successfully from the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation. But we are Answer. equally proud of our government's decision 10 years ago to support private sector business expansion in our Northern community. And I look forward to speaking to that in my supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. No one can argue that it's a small business that creates uh, a vast majority of jobs in this province. In 2013, our government implemented strategic programs to better align with key sectors identified in the growth plan, like the Business Opportunity Program, the Strategic Economic Infrastructure Program, and the Northern Innovation Program, as well as community capacity building and internship programs. The Minister has made it clear that we're we're continuing to work with all our northern organizations to keep building and creating jobs in northern Ontario. We need to support an innovative business climate across uh, the north. Can the minister please share the status of some of the NOHFC most recent investments when it comes to innovation and job creation in the north? Thank you, Minister. 
Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for the question. There's uh, so many examples. Just this past month, uh, uh, my colleague from uh, uh, Penobiotic Oak and I announced the expansion of broadband in, uh, in northwestern Ontario with a $750,000 expansion partnership with uh, T Bay Tel. In the, the film industry, in the culture industry, $3.4 million went into North Bay's uh, film and television industry. And one of our greatest investments, we're very proud of, our investments in uh, Sudbury Snow Lab, where Nobel Prize winner and uh, physicist Arthur McDonald did much of his research. Very proud of that as well. The bottom line is we are going to continue to invest in Northern Ontario. We're doing this for larger established businesses, small and startup businesses. We're fostering valuable work experience through our extremely successful Answer. internship program. Mr. Speaker, we're encouraging major business productivity and expansion, as well as global investment in Northern communities, and we're going to keep Thank on you. doing that as we expand the economy. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, it's expected all government departments track relevant data to identify areas that need improvement. Last week, I questioned the competency regarding lost or misplaced transcripts at the License Appeal Tribunal, the LAT for short, which adjudicates home warranty disputes. In addition, in response to my uh, question, Order Table Question 378, the Minister stated that matters that proceed to a hearing, statistics are not kept regarding dispositions at the LAT. Furthermore, Frank Denton, the ADM, stated homeowners are dissuaded from pursuing LAT appeals because the process is not transparent, is complicated, time-consuming, and unbalanced. Speaker, why does the minister frustrate new homeowners Question. and allow the LAT to hide data regarding case success and failure rates? Surely that is part of the problem. Thank you. Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the comment coming from my friend, the opposite party, but uh, you know what? I, uh, I wanted to remind him that the, uh, the administrative tribunal, I like court, I like judges, you know, they are independent. So the member from the opposition want me to get involved and tell them how to do their work. But I'll say this, you know, when my friend was appointed my critic, we call him and ask him, you know, we wanted to provide him with, uh, you know, a briefing. And uh, today he has not responded to our invitation. So I would like to, again, invite you, you know, to a briefing, and moreover, the president of that tribunal would like to answer. also meet with the member and answer all his questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, correct record, my office has never received a request from the Attorney General, but I'd be happy to go any time. Speaker, the Ministry of the Attorney General doesn't document these cases. However, the not-for-profit group Canadians for Property Built Homes does. Over the last nine years, they found that homeowners lost 90 per cent of the time at the LAT for their new home warranty claims. Speaker, the minister's tribunals have created a David versus Goliath situation for homeowners seeking remedies regarding new home warranties. And homeowners are being ripped off at this tribunal. And now, with Bill 15 passed, she will be adding auto accident disputes to this very much maligned and broken LAT system. Speaker, will the minister commit to fixing the outstanding and significant problems at the LAT before she grants them authority to adjudicate and rip off auto disputes as well? And again, Mr. Speaker, you know, those uh, tribunals are independent. We have a, a very a good chair of that tribunal. And if there is concern, you know, uh, I uh, like, again, the, uh, the chair of the tribunal would very much like to meet with the member of opposite and hear his concern. And again, I reiterate, you know, the invitation. I'll ask the member to check with his staff because it's the second time that we invite him, you know, to a briefing. So would you please check with your staff and accept our invitation to a briefing? Thank you, Mrs. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.